effect, a smart sanctions and effective remedies, ways to address gross violation of human rights. And hopefully that means each of you are in the right room. Today I'm joined by four very distinguished panelists, and we'll start in order of speaking from the left, my left, moving right. One of the things we're talking about, and as I understand, it's been somewhat of a common theme throughout today, is not necessarily the normative values that exist in human rights, but how we go about enforcing those normative values. And then even further, to the extent that penalties are a sufficient way to address those, how we create smart sanctions or effective penalties. Rather than go into extensive biographies, I'm just going to start by introducing the panel, and as I said, they'll speak from left to right, tell you briefly what each of them will be speaking about. They should be speaking between 15 and 20 minutes each, so that in the end, there will be a brief time period for questions and answers. On my far left is Professor David Whitman. He is from Cornell University and will be speaking about penalties and deterrence and issues more broadly. And then Susan Tiefenbrom from Thomas Jefferson School of Law will be speaking about sex trafficking, trafficking in women, and penalties addressing this violation of human rights. To my right is Professor Madeline Morris, Duke University, and she will be speaking about universal jurisdiction. And then last but by no means least is Professor Mary Ellen O'Connell from the Ohio State University School of Law. And she will be talking about sanctions, more economic sanctions, and something that may be distinct and an issue we haven't seen addressed often or enough when we're talking about gross violations of human rights. So I'll go ahead and, and yield the floor to Professor Whitman and let him begin. Uh, thank you, and my thanks to uh, the organizers and Professor Penrose in particular for putting together this panel. Uh, our topic is sanctions and effective remedies, and I guess I'm going to start by raising a question about effectiveness in connection with international criminal prosecutions and deterrence. That is, I want to consider the extent to which such prosecutions really do deter the commission of atrocities. I think it's fair to say that at this time, enthusiasm for international criminal prosecutions is at an all-time high. In the last 10 years, we've had two international criminal tribunals actually created, for Rwanda and former Yugoslavia. Uh, and there are three more that are under consideration, which was Sierra Leone, Indonesia, and Cambodia. Uh, the Pinochet proceedings have initiated or spurred similar proceedings in a number of countries around the world. And most importantly, uh, we seem to be moving inexorably towards the creation of the first ever permanent international criminal court. Now, advocates of international criminal prosecution like to proclaim this as the dawn of a new era. Uh, in their view, we may be moving towards adoption of what the Canadians like to call the human security agenda, uh, the notion being that protection of individual dignity uh, should take priority in international affairs and should, if not displace, at least supplement traditional notions of national security. At this kind of argument, there are many realists, or quasi-realists, who would respond with traditional concerns about the utility and effectiveness of international law in general, um, and international institutions and international criminal law in particular. Partly in response to some of these doubts, I think supporters of international criminal tribunals have been forced to make perhaps more aggressively than is appropriate the claim that international criminal prosecutions will effectively deter atrocities. The argument then goes that if this is true, uh, it will uh, further efforts to maintain peace and stability in various parts of the world, and that will lessen the burden on countries like the United States which might otherwise be forced to employ troops uh, to either maintain or restore peace once conflict is broken out. And so the argument goes, um, these prosecutions you know, should be favored even by those who have a hard-bitten, realist view of international affairs. Now, I think there are many reasons to consider supporting uh, international criminal prosecutions. It may be that we want to promote ideas of international justice. It may be that we think retribution is appropriate for serious crime. It may be that we want to avoid personal vengeance and the cycle of retaliation that that can generate. Uh, we might want to delegitimate particular leaders. And we might want to foster national reconciliation by providing for accurate historical accounts of events and by sub or shifting blame from entire communities to particular individuals for particular acts. But for many, the primary justification for international prosecutions remains deterrence the most important justification and goal. It seems to me that the connection between uh, prosecutions at the international level and deterrence is plausible, 
but largely unproven. Uh, <coughs> most claims seem to rest more on intuition, assumption, and anecdote than on actual empirical evidence. In fact, if you look at the historical record, it's not particularly encouraging. During the course of World War II, the Allies announced that the prosecution of German war criminals would be an important aim of the war, and they issued explicit warnings of prosecution to follow. Similarly, in the former Yugoslavia, the Security Council and various individual actors threatened and warned of prosecutions. Um, and yet there is no empirical evidence of effective deterrence in either case. Now, there are a number of possible responses to this apparent phenomenon of failed deterrence. One might be that um, it does not, in fact, demonstrate that there was no deterrence. It could be, for example, that a number of people were dissuaded from committing crimes they might otherwise have committed for fear of prosecution. It's just that not enough were deterred to make a visible impact on the course of events. Another more common argument is that the failure of deterrence reflects the inadequacy, inconsistency, and infrequency of actual prosecution. And here the argument is, if only we uh, accelerated the pace of prosecutions so that it looked more like uh, the frequency and consistency of effective national legal systems, then we would have effective deterrence. And the third argument is, even apart from the possibility of deterring specific actors in ongoing conflicts, International criminal prosecutions serve an important signaling and educational function. They may, over time, contribute to the reinforcement of humanitarian law norms, which will change the calculus of actors in the future. I think there is some merit to all of these positions. At the same time, I think there's a tendency to understate the obstacles to trying to achieve effective deterrence at the international level. Most arguments of specific uh, deterrence assume that we're talking about individuals engaged in rational actor calculations. Individuals who are thinking about the risk of possible prosecution and punishment and balancing it against whatever incentives they might have to commit a crime in the first place. Now, even assuming that that view is correct, I think looking at international criminal prosecutions right now, we'd have to conclude that the vast majority of actors would be right in thinking that the risk of prosecution is very slight. Prosecutions as a factual matter are rare. They're few and far between. Even in uh, places like the former Yugoslavia, where we have an effective international criminal tribunal up and running for the last seven years. Uh, despite its many accomplishments, the ICTY has prosecuted, or rather has tried and sentenced, I think, only 11 offenders. A number of others have uh, offered guilty pleas. There are a number of trials currently underway. The pace is picking up. But still, the total numbers are very, very small. Uh, and many of the key actors are still at large. Uh, the ICTR, or along the tribunal, has had its own similar problems. It too has actually tried and sentenced only a handful of individuals, although it has uh, successfully prosecuted at least a few of the major offenders. From the standpoint of low-ranking combatants uh, or offenders, the risk of actually being prosecuted must appear to be essentially the equivalent of losing the war crimes lottery. Now, compare this uh, risk against potential gains. And when I speak about gains, uh, I don't mean material gains in the sense of money or property, although that uh, is certainly an incentive for at least some actors. Uh, but I'm talking about the majority of actors. And here I think a recent survey by the International Committee of the Red Cross is very informative. The ICRC surveyed uh, combatants and non combatants in six war torn countries. Uh, and focusing for the moment on Bosnia, their conclusion was that. Those who engaged in atrocities, for the most part, were not a pathological fringe element. Instead, they were largely representative of the civilian populations in the communities from which they came. So why did these people uh, engage in or countenance the commission of ethnic cleansing and similar acts? Uh, well, the answer is, um, has several parts to it. But in general, these individuals appear to view the conflict in total war terms. That is, they saw this as a situation in which there was a very broad mobilization of all segments of society in support of one side or the other. Uh, all sides experienced serious losses. There was severe ethnic antagonism. And all this contributed to a blurring of the line between combatants and civilians. It became easy for people to assume that everybody on the other side was supporting the war effort and therefore to assimilate civilians to combatants. Moreover, participants um, believed that they were engaged in a desperate struggle to defend their community from attack. One can quarrel with their perception of events, uh, but that is the shared perception of each of the different groups, according to the survey. Uh, so when asked, why did you accept attacks on civilians, they replied, because of hatred of the other side. 
because of a sense of reciprocity, they are doing it to our people, and because of the view of themselves as defenders and the others as aggressors. And so many of these individuals came to the conclusion that for one's own side, the defenders, it is necessary to suspend the rules that limit conduct during wartime, while those rules should continue to apply to the other side's combatants, even as aggressors. Uh, to this perception, we have to add or factor in the problem of superior orders. It is, of course, the case in international law that superior orders are not a defense to a war crime. At the same time, they can be offered for mitigation. Uh, and I think this rule reflects a general societal understanding that an act carried out under command is profoundly different than spontaneous action. Now, Stanley Milgram, a social psychologist, did a number of famous experiments uh, on the, uh, the relationship between authority and obedience, concluded that a person who, under ordinary circumstances, would find it loathsome to kill or commit another crime might find it easy to do so when acting under superior authority. And of course, we know that in many of these conflicts, political and military leaders are, in fact, encouraging the commission of atrocities. Then, too, individuals who are out in combat in these situations face real penalties for failure to join in uh, with some of their fellow actors in committing uh, ethnic cleansing and similar acts. Penalties ranging from simple disaffection of one's comrades in the field to actual execution. To this, I would add very briefly uh, a reference to Professor Morris's work. Uh, Professor Morris has an extremely interesting article about the relationship between military culture and the incidence of rape in wartime. Uh, and while she can explain this much better than I can, uh, her article demonstrates or argues that military groups have their own social structure and uh, their a form of primary group with strong group cohesion, where group norms and attitudes strongly influence behavior. And what are uh, the norms and attitudes of military units in combat? Well, the norm is to destroy the enemy uh, in ways that leave little room for sensitivity, compassion, remorse, and so forth. Particularly when the combatants view themselves as committed to an ideology of the defense of their nation, supported in turn by official propaganda, vilifying members of opposing groups. So when you combine all these influences, which might favor attacks on civilians, the notion that you're defending their community, hatred of the other side, a view of civilians and combatants is indistinguishable, and political and military leaders encouraging attacks, uh, it's easy to see that a, real, a low risk of prosecution will have little deterrent effect. What about political leaders? I've been talking about ordinary combatants. Um, well, I think we can assume that indicted leaders such as Slobodan Milosevic understood at the outset that they were engaged on a high-risk course of action. Presumably he knew that at some point in time he might lose power, as he now has, and might face the prosecution either at the national or international level. But at the same time, he had incentives to do what he did. Uh, it appeared that he deliberately fostered intercommunal conflict and hostility as a means to secure political power and personal wealth and evidently judged the risk trade-off more than acceptable. In fact, there's little evidence that the threat of prosecution deterred him in any significant way. In Bosnia, crimes, commit, uh, crimes continued apace even after the creation of the ICTY. In Kosovo, uh, there were numerous war crimes committed by forces under uh, Slobodan Milosevic's control, even after he was indicted. Now, this is not to say that prosecutions have no effect. Uh, in Kosovo, for example, we know that many of the Serbs engaged in ethnic cleansing took to wearing, to wearing black ski masks. I assume they did so not because it was cold, but because they wanted to conceal their identity, either for fear of retribution, uh, or for shame, or for fear of prosecution. We also know that as NATO's uh, prospect of assuming control over Kosovo loomed larger, Serbs engaged in ethnic cleansing took great pains or increasing pains to conceal mass graves and otherwise to hide evidence of what they had been engaged in. But I think we don't know whether this translated into deterrence or simply into efforts to conceal the evidence of crimes uh, which were committed anyway. Now, can we enhance deterrence through um, increasing the level and frequency of prosecution? At some level, I think the answer to that has to be yes, perhaps even tautologically so. But getting there is far harder than I think uh, many advocates of international prosecutions are prepared to acknowledge. As a practical matter, in a large-scale armed conflict, particularly bitter internal conflicts of the sort that are now dominant, there will be numerous, numerous uh, potential offenders or um, indictees. And it will rarely, if ever, be possible to prosecute anything more than a representative sample. 
and it wasn't possible after World War II, it hasn't been possible and won't be possible for the ICTY, which has publicly acknowledged that given restraints on resources, a lack of international political support, uh, and the lack of cooperation with these states, it can do no more than prosecute representative offenders for which it has to make hard choices. The ICTY, ICTR, the Rwandan Tribunal, has had even worse problems, leading the government of Rwanda to publicly register a vote of no confidence and to question its deterrent capacity. Now compare for, for a moment what's happening at the national level in Rwanda. Uh, the government there has engaged in massive prosecutions, something like 20,000 indictments, 2,000 criminal trials, 18,000 guilty pleas. If we put aside for a moment human rights concerns associated with the way in which this has happened and focus only on and will this deter atrocities, uh, I think we still don't really know. In fact, many of the genocidaires who were responsible for uh, the atrocities in 1994 are still at large, still active, still promoting uh, the same kinds of ideology that they did before, and wanting to return to power. If they're successful, I don't think we have reason to be optimistic that they will be deterred. And sadly, Bosnia and Rwanda are the success stories. In most instances, efforts to create ad hoc tribunals elsewhere have foundered or have not been attempted at all. What about the International Criminal Court? Will this be the solution? Um, it seems to me that the lofty expectations many hold with respect to the International Criminal Court resemble those once held for the International Court of Justice. In my own view, the ICCC may, like the International Court of Justice, serve important functions and can contribute to the clarification and development of international law. And I think it can strengthen the relevant humanitarian law norms in ways which over time will contribute to their greater effectiveness. But at least in the short term, I'm not persuaded it will have a major impact on the incidence of violations of international humanitarian law. For one thing, it's a court of limited jurisdiction. It will be difficult for it to influence uh, crimes committed in internal conflicts in non-party states unless the Security Council is prepared to act. And it also faces a severe resource constraint challenge. The annual budget of the ICTY is around 100 million. It gets much of its support, political, financial, logistical, from the United States. The U.S. has said it will not support the ICC in its current form, and so I think we have reason to be concerned about whether it will have the resources it needs. It may be that national court prosecutions will fill in. Certainly, the complementarity regime of the ICC is designed to foster national court prosecutions. But whether Pinochet style or ICC induced, I think these are likely to increase in number, but to remain sporadic, uh, at least for the foreseeable future and not possible at all in countries where principal offenders continue to retain substantial power. That leaves us with the question of general deterrence. Putting aside for the moment issues of specific deterrence, will international criminal prosecutions stigmatize ethnic cleansing and similar, and similar acts and lead to a culture of compliance over time? I think they can contribute to that goal, but we should bear in mind that the signaling effect is not always as clear as we would like. Serbs, for example, tend to view the ICTY as a biased institution, and so they may not see its judgments as confirming important social norms. More importantly, going back to the ICRC survey, uh, one of the things it shows is that the promulgation and even the internalization of norms of humanitarian law is not enough. Uh, it was not the case, according to this survey in Bosnia, that people were unaware of the Geneva Conventions or did not agree with them. In fact, uh, a surprisingly large majority, something like 80%, were familiar with the conventions, and of that 80%, uh, close to 90% could describe them relatively accurately. Moreover, people agreed that the norms that protected non-combatants should generally be respected. What happened was that the limits on behavior during wartime gave them, not because of unfamiliarity or even disagreement with the norms, but rather under the pressure of nationalist passions and other wartime considerations. So let me conclude by saying I'm not arguing against international criminal prosecutions. Quite to the contrary, I favor them. I think we should be wary of exaggerated claims of benefits so that we don't set up a false standard for judging the success or failure of international criminal tribunals. I don't think we want people to look five years down the road and say, or 10 years down the road and say the ICC is not deterred crime, therefore, it's ineffective and useless, uh, that would be an unfortunate outcome. Thank you.
timely and insightful commentary. And now I'm going to turn to Professor Tieferbaum from Thomas Jefferson School of Law, who will be talking about trafficking of women and penalties in addressing that issue. Yes, I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, a very lucrative international business. It's called sex trafficking. More than two million women and children around the world are bought and sold each year for the purpose of sexual exploitation. 50,000 of these women are trafficked into the United States in a modern day form of slavery. Under the laws and practices of the United States uh, and in many other countries of the world, victims are denied an effective remedy. They are denied an effective remedy against the traffickers. In a desperate attempt to seek help from the authorities, the women are detained <coughs> pending deportation. They're locked up for long periods of time because they are illegal aliens. They are arrested in brothel raids, and then they're deported to their home country, where they suffer further humiliation of being treated as criminals <coughs> or pariahs, simply because they were duped into believing that they could find legitimate work in the United States or in other countries. And to add insult to injury, the victims suffer the punishment. Their protected, well-protected perpetrators go off scot-free, having been charged, if at all, with a minor immigration law violation. And this uh, human rights violation, this crime called sex trafficking, is very likely to increase because the current laws are weak, sometimes non-existent in countries, and they are not enforced. It is precisely because the penalty for sex trafficking is so light that the sex trade industry is flourishing and has become attractive to the international organized crime networks who are turning away from drug trafficking to sex trafficking. Unless specific enforceable laws aimed at prevention, protection, and prosecution are enacted on the national level, this serious human rights violation is likely to continue globally. Countries around the world vary widely in their approach to penalties for the crime of trafficking, procuration, which is basically the act of procuring women for new purposes, uh, which is basically forced prostitution, and procuration <coughs> with coercion, violence. In a new bill, recently passed overwhelmingly by the Senate and the House of Representatives, a bill which is now sitting on President Clinton's desk, Congress proposes to set up a coordinated effort to criminalize the conduct of traffickers and to finally penalize the sex traffickers as if this were a crime as serious as rape. However, the question still remains whether this law, when and if adopted, will reach the interlocking rings of businessmen, modern mafias, and corrupt government officials <coughs> in other countries and in our country. These are the people working behind this egregious human rights violation and if it does reach, and it can reach, these uh, international organized crime rings, will the law be enforced here? And then the third question is, if we enforce an effective law, will that influence other nations to do the same? Because this is a, a cooperative crime. What is sex trafficking according to the definitions? And definition is a very serious problem with this crime, and I'll explain why in a minute. This recent bill, which is the <laughs> Victims of Trafficking uh, and um, Violence Against Women Protection uh, Act of the year 2000, this bill defines sex trafficking as the purchase, sale, recruitment, <coughs> harboring, transportation, transfer, or receipt of a person for the purpose of commercial sex acts. They also uh, distinguish between sex trafficking and severe forms of trafficking in persons, which involve involuntary slavery and servitude 
through practices of fraud, coercion, and deception. Consent is not an issue in either of these two definitions. And that's an important point because people turn away from sex trafficking thinking that the women really want to do this stuff. But consent should not be an issue. The 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution outlaws slavery and prohibits an individual from selling himself or herself into bondage. Multilateral treaties and customary international law condemn slavery. And since its inception, the United Nations has been committed to the abolition or, or elimination of slavery. You can't sign a contract into slavery. Despite a plethora of UN recommendations, decisions, and uh, uh, other pronouncements, slavery is not dead. It looms large abroad and in the United States. And the traffic and sale of human beings for sexual exploitation is flourishing. Statistics. The numbers of women and children for the purposes of prostitution, forced prostitution, today is as high and maybe higher than it was during the African slave trade of the 1700s. And the United States is one of the primary destination points for trafficked women, especially from the Soviet Union. Examples of this, some Latvian women were threatened and forced to dance nude in Chicago. Thai women were brought to the United States for the sex industry and then forced to be virtual sex slaves. Uh, this goes on in the Northern Mariana Islands, which is uh, uh, governed by US law. Hearing impaired and mute Mexicans were brought to the United States, enslaved, beaten, raped, forced to peddle trinkets in New York City. Trafficking instances were reported in 20 different states in the United States, with most cases occurring in New York, in California, and in Florida, and some in North Carolina, interestingly enough. The INS has discovered over 250 brothels likely to be involved in trafficking in 26 different cities. Where are the source countries? They are mainly uh, Thailand, Vietnam, China, Mexico, <coughs> Russia, Ukraine, the Czech Republic, but also they come from <coughs> Philippines, Korea, Malaysia, Latvia, Hungary, Poland, Brazil, and Honduras, and they come to the United States. Once uncovered, trafficking and slavery cases in the United States take about a year and a half to investigate and to prosecute. Make no bones about it, the uh, mafia and the international crime organizations are running the sex trafficking industry through powerful networks which trade and traffic impoverished women by the use of force, fraud, and coercion. For what? For commercial gain. For example, in China, the Sun Yi An, the 14K, the Big Circle Boys, the Wo Unlock Triads have been linked repeatedly to smuggling illegal immigrants and prostitution rackets. The Japanese organized crime rings, the Yakuza, are involved in trafficking in women and in the adult entertainment industry, which in Japan is booming. The usual pay for women is 2 million yen, or approximately $15,000. At, at least seven families in Bangkok, Thailand, recruit, sell, and smuggle prostitutes. Russian organized crime is pervasive in the field of sex trafficking. And um, Ukrainian uh, international organized crime makes enormous profits in this. Poland and Albania, the uh, examples are endless. The point I am making is that the reason it goes on is it is very profitable. The crimes associated with sex trafficking are many. They're closely intertwined with extortion, racketeering, money laundering, bribery, bribery of public officials, drug use, gambling, smuggling, loan sharking, conspiracy, <laughs> document forgery, uh, mail forgery, and fraud. How is it done? What's the process? Because it sometimes is in a disguised form. Women are trafficked from relatively poor countries, war-torn countries, many of them are refugees, and they're trafficked through a transit country having relaxed immigration laws, 
and finally into a relatively rich destination country, the United States, uh, Western Europe, Japan, where the woman is duped into believing she will find a better life, prosperity. These young, impoverished refugee women are sometimes sold to traffickers by their own parents for money. In a different scenario, a young, poverty-stricken woman might initially be introduced to the services of a loan shark by a friendly other woman who is dressed well, speaks the native uh, speaks the woman's native language, compliments her, tell, tells her she's pretty, invites her to her home, take, gives a drink, gives her some gifts, and says, gee, I can get you out of your situation. I have a friend who will help you get a visa and who will help you get a passport and will take you to uh, the Netherlands where you will work in a restaurant. All you have to do is pay him $13,000. Oh, I don't have We'll work it out. During the course of this good dinner, she slips her a couple of drugs. The woman becomes unconscious. The girl becomes unconscious. And the guardian angel, who the young woman thought was going to give her the better life, passes her, now unconscious, onto the agent, the trafficker, who drives her across the border to another country, a foreign land where she doesn't speak the foreign language. And when she wakes up, she is told that she now belongs to this guy, and she will have to work off the debt of $50,000 that she just incurred because he got her to this other country and paid the transportation, the visa, and the passport. She is then forced to work in a brothel, chained to her bed, uh, uh, threatened, and uh, in debt bondage for years in this condition. She is defenseless, and she is unprotected by the law. She is held by her captor in debt bondage. She must work inhumane hours under terrible labor conditions. If she is rebellious, the trafficker will beat her, rape her, gang rape her, and force her to be left in a room, tied, chained in many cases, to her bed for days alone, without food and water, drugged frequently to make her more uh, de dependent and defenseless in order to frighten and break her rebellious spirit. Here she remains, unprotected in an alien land, without any hope of escape. And if she tries to escape, her family back home is threatened. So let's say she escapes and she gets to the police station. What does she find there? She is confronted with an even harsher reality that the police are not going to protect her, but they are protecting the international crime organization, the network. And it is in fact the police that, are, that is um, uh, using the services of the, of the uh, brothels. There is documented corruption and complicity by law enforcement officials throughout the sex trafficking process in countries of origin, countries of transit, and countries of destination. Bribes, payoffs are given to local visa officials, to border patrol officers. The police rarely attempt to arrest the brothel owners. If the victim is caught by her trafficker, her life becomes a living hell. If the victim is caught by the police, they don't recognize her as a victim. They treat her as a criminal. She is thrown into detention pending deportation. Why all this is it? Why is it going on? Profit, profit, profit. It is at the root of the whole business. In the drug trafficking industry, the high prices and highly sought after narcotics products can be sold only once. But when you commodify a human being, she can be sold over and over again. The potential profits in the sex trade industry are very high. The risk for perpetrators is very low. Traffickers make anywhere from $8 million in a period ranging from one to six years. <coughs> are there any laws prohibiting this? There are international laws prohibiting this. Unfortunately, they have no enforcement capabilities. 
And that is one of the reasons why the uh, Korean women are suing uh, the uh, Japanese um, government for um, their activities during the war in the United States courts. Domestic laws. Do we have any domestic laws prohibiting sex trafficking? Oh yes, more than 154 countries currently have legislation in the form of procuration laws, procuration with coercion, and some even have sex trafficking laws. Problem here, enforcement, very low penalties. Um, France, for example, where prostitution was legal, punishes a, pro a procurer with five years of imprisonment. I've actually sat through many of these um, uh, procuration um, cases in France and in, uh, in the Nice Tribunal almost every summer I'm there and um, they're, a, they're a joke uh, because if you get them at all uh, you, they're put away for six months, a year and that's it. Penalties in the United States. In the United States a drug dealer gets 20 years to life. In the United States a sex trafficker will get maybe 10 years if it's prosecuted at all. The, um, <clears throat> the problem is that the U.S. attorneys do not want to prosecute these cases for involuntary servitude. They're very paper-oriented, and the penalties are very light. The prosecutors claim they do everything they can possibly do to prosecute these cases, but that the penalties are too light. What is the status of U.S. law on sex trafficking? <coughs> Currently, there is a law sitting on the desk of Mr. Clinton, which will and can solve the problem about weak enforcement. Because all we had before this law was the Mann Act, which is the White Slavery Act, the Involuntary Servitude and Slavery Section 1581, we could sue on recruitment and smuggling and transporting aliens or harboring for prostitution, but most of these cases were not terribly effective. <coughs> Immigration also is a serious problem in the issue of sex trafficking. The INS claims that these women who are victims, <coughs> yes, are in fact illegal aliens. And why should we play favorites with them? They should be detained and deported just like any other illegal alien. So basically, the immigration is working against the protection of the victim. What will the new bill, the Victims of Trafficking and Violence Protection Act of 2000, do to change this picture? Violators will now be sentenced to prison for 20 years to life. They will also be asked to give back full restitution to the victims, paying them the salary that they would have earned for months or years of involuntary servitude. The law allocates $3.3 billion to increase financing for shelters. The law increased, uh, allocates $100 million to set up programs in foreign <coughs> countries in order to um, uh, enhance the cooperation uh, in this very interconnected uh, crime. A very interesting effect of the new law, it will set up 5,000 new T visas, wherein the victim who agrees to assist in the prosecution will be given the rare opportunity to become a permanent resident. Finally, we are giving protection. And now, where's the prevention? The law requires that the, uh, a special task force chaired by the Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, will be, able, will be required to, to draft annual reports on countries that are not complying with <coughs> minimum standards for sex trafficking. And what will be the penalty for those nations? Economic sanctions. I ask us today to question the advisability of economic sanctions, because who gets hurt most when there's economic sanctions imposed on a nation? It's the women and the children living in that land. So maybe we can come up with a smart sanction, uh, but this law uh, is better than what we had before, and I'm not knocking it. Uh, what I would like to uh, uh, conclude with today is that we have to upset the economic balance 
of profitability for the sex trade industry <coughs> by increasing the risk for the sex traffickers so that they have more to lose than to gain by engaging in this horrific crime, this degrading and dehumanizing violation of human rights. And if we upset that economic balance by imposing severe penalties, the threat of life imprisonment, maybe the sex traffickers will leave the industry alone <coughs> and go on to bigger and better things. But um, it is a thought. My only fear, however, is, and I will end on that note, that once we have the law, how do we get it enforced? How can we uh, assure that it will be enforced without perhaps establishing, and this is a, a, a thought, an agency for the civil rights enforcement, like we did in the 60s for the Civil Rights Acts? Set up an agency to enforce this law. How can we be sure it's going to be enforced? And if it's enforced, how can we be assured that the foreign countries will also set up legislation that is effective and will be enforced? <coughs> Thirdly, how can we be sure the victim will be protected here in the United States, but even more importantly, her family back home? Because these victims will not be enticed by permanent residency in the United States if they know their families will be killed in Thailand or in Malaysia. The carrot is just not going to work. So uh, I end on that note. Thank you very much for your comments on an often overlooked issue. And now I'm going to shift gears and allow Professor Madeline Morris from Duke University to address the issue of universal jurisdiction. Thank you. The context in which I want to talk about universal jurisdiction <laughs> Um, probably relates more in terms of its subject matter um, to Professor Whitman's uh, talk in the sense that it's going to um, relate from primarily or specifically really to genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. There's a, a problem that's central to the whole issue of jurisdiction over those crimes, genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, which is that governments frequently collude in the commission of those crimes. The Khmer Rouge, the Nazis, the interim government of Rwanda, so many uh, regimes have been involved um, officially as well as unofficially in commission of those kinds of offenses. So for that reason, we would be unwise to rely exclusively on the usual municipal mechanisms for law enforcement. We wouldn't expect the government implicated in our responsibility for the crimes to be efficacious in the prosecution of those offenses. So the problem then is how to shape a jurisdictional structure that circumvents obstruction by perpetrator regimes while at the same time maintaining legitimate foundations for the exercise of judicial power. One mechanism commonly proposed for this purpose is, of course, universal jurisdiction. Under universal jurisdiction, the courts of any state may exercise jurisdiction over the relevant crimes without regard to the territory where the crime occurred or the nationality of its perpetrators or victims. The reasoning is that as these crimes are in front to humanity, they are of concern to all states. By giving jurisdiction to all states to prosecute, the problem of governmental collusion and resultant unwillingness to prosecute is ameliorated. The attraction of universal jurisdiction is compelling. Law should intervene when innocent human beings are being slaughtered. If all states have jurisdiction, then at least some perpetrators will be prosecuted some of the time, and some of the purposes of the, of the criminal law in this context will be accomplished. And I uh, am very much um, sympathetic to the question, exactly what are those purposes, and to what extent will they be uh, accomplished? I think we have to, to be very realistic about that. I'd like to look a little bit at the strengths and weaknesses of universal jurisdiction um, and then briefly also talk a little bit about some alternatives there too. The case for universal jurisdiction would be a very strong one if we could assure that prosecutions under universal jurisdiction would be carried out impartially and with due process, that the law to be applied 
would consist of the universally accepted content of international law, and that national executive organs would have some form of control in order to avoid a, situ a situation where a proposed exercise of universal jurisdiction would have really disastrous um, international relations consequences. The problem with universal jurisdiction is that we cannot ensure that those conditions are met. There, there's a real risk that, in fact, the reverse will occur, that we'll have um, universal jurisdiction prosecutions that will be biased, that will not be carried out with due process, that will exceed the scope of what is established international law, um, or that will be undertaken without sufficient political control to avoid dire consequences on the international relations plane. The question that I think we need to ask about universal jurisdiction is whether the benefits will in fact be worth the risks. The benefits are compelling, as I've said, at the same time, I think we need to take a, a careful look at what the drawbacks may be. Sometimes universal jurisdiction will work well, perpetrators will be duly prosecuted and punished, and the purposes of criminal law will be served. Sometimes that won't be the case. Let's look first at the due process problem. <coughs> There's an assumption underlying universal jurisdiction, and actually it's one that's perplexing to me. There's an assumption apparently that the courts of law-abiding states will be the ones to exercise universal jurisdiction, and that they will provide justice where criminal actors and abusive regimes would otherwise have impunity for their crimes. But there's no guarantee that universal jurisdiction will actually operate in that way. Universal jurisdiction empowers the courts of all states equally Justice systems that are corrupt, abusive, or lawless are empowered equally with others. In light of that fact, we need to be concerned about the, uh, the quality of justice that will emerge. The lack of judicial independence in many countries uh, presents a threshold problem. The recent case of Hassan Habre illustrates the point. Habre, as you know, ruled Chad during the 1980s and based on universal jurisdiction, was indicted last February in Senegal on multiple uh, charges of torture allegedly committed during his rule of Chad. Last March, Senegal elected a new president. Since President Wade took office, shenanigans, to say the least, have been going on in the Habre case. About three months after Wade's election, uh, the indicting chamber of the court hearing the case was deliberating a motion to, to dismiss. At the same time, a panel headed by President Wade called an unscheduled meeting of the Superior Council of the Magistracy of Senegal. At that meeting, the investigating judge for the Habre case, in effect of the prosecutor, was removed from his post. At the same time, the president of the indicting chamber was promoted to the state council. On July 4th, that president of the indicting chamber dismissed all charges against Habre. All of that occurred after President Wade had, had appointed Hagre's defense lawyer as his special legal advisor. There's reason, obviously, to believe that there was judicial, there was tampering with the judiciary at the very highest level in the Hagre case. In that instance, it appears to have resulted in the dismissal of the prosecution. In other circumstances, it may well be that non-independent judiciaries will be politically influenced to indict or to convict. Another, another form of due process problem would arise if states apply law that goes beyond what's universally established um, international law. Obviously not all states share a common view of what is the content of international law as it would relate to some aspects or some issues uh, involving <coughs> crimes like genocide or especially war crimes, uh, war crimes against humanity. Um, for example, some states take the view that the use of cluster bombs or damaging of uh, water supplies or electrical grids in some circumstances, um, such as those that were the case in the Kosovo operation by NATO, um, constitute war crimes, a view not shared by the NATO states. These issues would, would um, raise due process problems in universal jurisdiction prosecutions if, again, those prosecutions or to apply law that goes beyond what's customary, what's clearly and beyond doubt the content of customary international law on the subject. The prosecutions wouldn't fulfill the due process requirements that the criminal law be non-vague, specific, and prospective in its application. 
Diplomatic protection, of course, is the mechanism through which states ordinarily attempt to protect their nationals from miscarriages of justice at the hands of foreign governments. But we can't assume that diplomatic protection will shield defendants from prosecutions that are politically influenced or otherwise lacking in due process. Um, we can look at many examples. Um, the case of Lori Berenson is probably not a bad illustration. In 1995, Lori Barron's an American citizen. And I use American citizen here because the, there's sometimes the assumption that the U.S. has little to worry about. The U.S. is so powerful of all things that the U.S. shouldn't be concerned. This is an American citizen sentenced to a life uh, imprisonment for treason by a court in Peru. Uh, Barron was alleged to have assisted the Tupac Amaro revolutionary movement in planning an attack on Peru's Congress. Barrison was tried in a secret proceeding before a panel of military judges wearing ski masks. Ski masks seems to be a theme. Um, since that time, Berenson was in prison first in a high altitude prison where she developed um, partial blindness and other health problems, and since then um, in a lower altitude jail. Um, the U.S. has not been successful since the trial in 1996 in providing diplomatic protection to Ms. Berenson. Uh, responding to a Peruvian court's decision a few weeks ago to grant parents a new trial, the U.S. State Department has expressed that we're very pleased by the decision by the military court. Since Ms. Berenson's conviction nearly five years ago, we have maintained that the trial proceedings against her did not meet due process standards, so we're very, we very much welcome the court's decision. Notwithstanding the efforts of the U.S. State Department, whatever those may have been, Berenson's remained in prison in Peru for nearly five years and will now face retrial in Peruvian courts, courts which, according to last February's U.S. State Department report, don't meet international standards for due process. <coughs> States and <coughs> non-governmental organizations, human rights organizations, are correctly very concerned about lack of due process and uh, judicial independence in many countries. States sometimes refuse extradition requests on this basis and human rights organizations dedicate their efforts to exposing and reforming uh, inadequate and flawed judiciaries. In considering universal jurisdiction, we can't lose sight of that part of the problem. Um, that's the part that's perplexing to me. Um, there's, there's the very appropriate concern expressed by human rights organizations to address the um, shortcomings, uh, to say the least, um, the, the abuses. Um, and the corruptness that goes on in many of the judiciaries of the world, and yet at the same time, uh, a, a degree of complacency, I think, about empowering those very same judiciaries um, in, with reach that is extraterritorial um, and virtually global, insofar as the, um, as the custody problem can be uh, um, dealt with, or, or, or having trials in absentia, which of course is um, while in mean, way more problematic in very practical terms, less problematic. So we need to ask whether, in considering universal jurisdiction, it's wise to augment the power and extraterritorial reach of all of the judiciaries of the world, and to do so um, precisely in the very category of cases that's particularly prone to politicization. <coughs> In addition to due process problems, we need to think also about interstate relations um, and the relationship between universal jurisdiction and interstate conflict. And because official acts will often be at issue in prosecutions under universal jurisdiction, um, which as we started out by saying was precisely the reason why universal jurisdiction is needed, uh, is because governments do, do collude in these crimes. But at the same time, that fact, the fact that governments collude in these crimes, means that official acts will frequently be at issue in prosecutions under universal jurisdiction. And so what we'll have is the judgment of one state's policies and perhaps one state's leaders in the courts of another state. In such instances, there's an obvious and significant risk that universal jurisdiction will become an instrument of interstate conflict. The starting point of the rationale for universal jurisdiction is that all states have an interest, a, a um, international interest that are, it would be shared by all of them in ensuring accountability for the crimes in question. Even if we accept for argument's sake the existence of such a unity of interest, the interests of states obviously diverge on a great number of other matters. Because prosecutions for war crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity 
will not exist in isolation from those other inter aspects of interstate relations, we can anticipate that universal jurisdiction sometimes may be used as a tool for achieving other political ends. The problem of political deployment of universal jurisdiction could arise in two somewhat different ways. First, states might exercise universal jurisdiction as a means of gain gaining advantage over their opponents in interstate conflicts by prosecuting nationals of those opponent states for their conduct carried out in the course of the con conflict in question. Uh, in the recent war in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Angola and its allies, Namibia and Zimbabwe, fought and supported the government of the Congo in opposition to Rwanda and its allies. It's not difficult to imagine Angolan officials seeking to prosecute Rwandan officials, for example, for alleged genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity committed against Congolese victims uh, in the course of that war. Or the political deployment of universal jurisdiction might arise in a, a slightly different way. States may exercise universal jurisdiction as a means of gaining advantage over their opponents by prosecuting nationals of their opponents for conduct unrelated to the conflict in, between the two states. So staying with the Central African scenario, we can imagine, for example, Rwandan officials seeking to prosecute Zimbabwean leaders for crimes against humanity allegedly committed in the violent expropriation of land owned by whites in Zimbabwe. Another example, this time not hypothetical, uh, comes from the Middle East. Monday's newspaper reports a statement by the Arab League that Arab states will freeze all but formal diplomatic relations with Israel, and in the same statement that, quote, Arab nations shall pursue, in accordance with international law, those responsible for these brutal practices. Uh, they're referring to alleged Israeli crimes under the Geneva Conventions against Palestinians. In these ways, and probably in other ways uh, as yet unforeseen, universal jurisdiction could be utilized as a weapon of interstate conflict. Now, you may observe at this point, you would write, you'd be right in doing so, that if the potential for improper use of universal jurisdiction were so great, then it's perplexing that we don't see more examples already of its misuse. Indeed, it's true that most of the uh, exercises of universal jurisdiction in, the, in its modern applications have functioned essentially as intended, um, although the, the, the most high-profile cases of uh, Pinochet and Habre um, represent a, a more, much more complex picture. One explanation that might be offered for the relative absence of misuse of universal jurisdiction might be that the states that have the most power to exercise universal jurisdiction tend to have developed justice systems with internal controls that would um, foster due process and judicial independence, and that those are not states that will uh, abuse universal jurisdiction. Uh, and that lawless states, by contrast, won't bother with universal jurisdiction because they'll just um, have such summary uh, proceedings as they wish and um, won't bother to invoke niceties of universal jurisdiction at all. So those combined predictions would suggest that universal jurisdiction should do little mischief in practice. I would be more cautious, um, though, I would be very cautious about being confident about that, um, that always playing out in just that way. First of all, even lawless states attempt to justify their actions to domestic or international audiences or both. Um, the Serbian government did not, for example, just execute or even summarily incarcerate the two Canadians and two Britons that it arrested uh, last August. Uh, instead, Milosevic denounced the charges of terrorism and his, um, publicized his plans for prosecutions. Uh, similarly, Milosevic accused four Dutch nationals arrested in Serbia last July of plotting to kidnap Milosevic. The need for justification and rhetorical advantage uh, remains great for all states. There's no reason to assume that universal jurisdiction would be found useless uh, by lawless regimes. There's also another important reason not to be complacent about the modern exercise of universal jurisdiction. The modern use of universal jurisdiction is in its very earliest stages. Um, it seems likely that the great potential of universal jurisdiction is being now recognized not only by the well-intentioned governments and organizations of the world, um, but, but, but by the malefactors as well. What remains to be seen is how universal jurisdiction is really going to function in the coming months and years, uh, now that the, the cat is out of the bag, 
Universal jurisdiction has real drawbacks. Um, and yet, the need for some means to confront, to punish, to deter, um, we hope, and certainly to condemn international crimes uh, remains very pressing. There are a number of alternatives to universal jurisdiction. Um, none of them, I hasten to say, uh, perfect. Within the past decade, as you know, we've seen the creation of two ad hoc criminal tribunals by the Security Council. Um, those have some value, whether the um, continuum, whether we can count on the Security Council uh, in the future in any consistent way to create such ad hoc tribunals is, um, is very unlikely. Uh, more unlikely, of course, because of the um, emergence of a very important uh, permanent international criminal court for which there was a treaty signed uh, in 1998 and which will likely come into existence um, within the next, we don't know, two years, it, it looks like. Um, there's momentum towards uh, its garnering the necessary 60 states parties required by the Treaty for International Criminal Court in order for such a court to come into existence. Such a court has enormous potential, um, but has the significant weakness that as a treaty-based court, its jurisdiction must be limited to the nationals of party states, in my opinion. Um, that's the view of the U.S. government as well, but as you know, it is certainly, um, at the, that issue is certainly at the heart of a very heated kind of controversy. An additional alternative approach for pursuing accountability for international crimes is the mixed tribunal. Tribunal composed of a combination of national and international judges um, are, are current and other personnel are, are currently being created for Cambodia and Sierra Leone, as you know, and in a somewhat different form for these two more. The mixed tribunal structure actually has a number of advantages. Uh, a a well-constituted mixed tribunal would have the potential to conduct prosecutions while avoiding the worst forms of politicization and due process abuses. Um, it could, in suitable circumstances, reinforce post-conflict governments, which can contribute to the training and development of the judiciaries. Um, would continue to develop international law in a, decent, in a decentralized way, which has advantages as well as drawbacks. Um, but mixed tribunals, of course, have real limitations. Um, prime among them, the fact that such tribunals can only operate with the consent and participation of the um, government of the principally affected state. Um, that means that this will be applicable only in post-conflict regime, post-regime change situations, or in those relatively rare situations where the government is not directly involved in the crimes. <coughs> There's also the possibility of the application of the usual forms of um, national jurisdiction, territorial, national protective um, principle, and passive personality. Uh, basis for prosecutions. None of these is perfect. You see immediately the, the drawbacks of all of these. Nevertheless, in different circumstances, different uh, of, of these alternatives to universal jurisdiction have been useful. I think it's a hard issue. I, and what, what is curious to me <coughs> is the really notable reluctance to take a critical view um, of universal jurisdiction, and indeed of any of the jurisdictional mechanisms for the prosecution of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Maybe because of the really heartrending nature of the crimes, proposed enforcement and um, jurisdictional mechanisms often escape really rigorous scrutiny. The usual criticism of universal jurisdiction, if one is made at all, is that it won't be used enough that states acting in their own self-interest won't uh, concern themselves to the degree necessary to exercise jurisdiction over crimes not directly affecting them. Um, but I think, in fact, that the, the risks of universal jurisdiction go well beyond that. We should proceed very carefully, I think, in pursuing jurisdictional mechanisms in this field. There's an awful need to do something. Uh, and I think that we have to exercise real restraint and discipline not allowing that need to do something uh, to make us incautious in deciding exactly what it is that ought to be done. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm going to yield the floor to our final speaker of the morning, and then it appears that we should have a few minutes for questions.
But now I'm going to introduce Mary Ellen O'Connell, professor at The Ohio State University, who will be speaking about economic sanctions and other sanctions instituted by the United Nations. And, and I, I guess I'm going to also follow a theme that seems to be developing on the panel, which is with regard to having um, a more cautious view to the sanctions that we apply for violations of, of international law. When May organized the panel, she um, asked us to think about what sanctions should be applied for accountability for violations of international law. And I asked her if I could shift that a little bit and think about how um, to make our sanctions <coughs> accountable in themselves. We plainly, as Professor Morris just said, we want responses to violations of international law. We preferably like them to be effective, as uh, Professor Whitman underscored, um, and Professor Tiefenbrunn. On the other hand, I think regardless of their effectiveness, they should in all cases be lawful sanctions. They should meet the principles of international law in themselves. Now, Professor Penrose has um, written about this with regard to international criminal law, what is the right sanction, what is the lawful sanction to, in response to the act of an individual who has violated international criminal law. I want to comment this afternoon on the need for legality in the application of multilateral sanctions in responding to violations of international law. In the last several months, there's been a great deal of attention in the media about the inhumanity of United Nations sanctions, particularly in the context of Iraq. But Iraq, let's not forget, is not the first um, uh, sanctions regime in which these problems were raised. Um, I want to recall for you a comment that Michael Reisman made in 1995 about the sanctions regime applied in Haiti. The wealthy elite and the military command were waxing rich off the contraband industry the economic sanctions had spawned. The rest of the population, which had been deprived of its popularly elected government and whom we were supposed to be helping, was without exaggeration, starving to death. Arguably, the inhumane impacts of these sanctions regimes could have been mitigated if the Security Council had applied these sanctions consistently with general rules of international law with regard to countermeasures, the legal regime applicable to sanctions. But this statement invites, I think, two questions, and that's what I want to explore with you today. First, is the Security Council bound by general rules of international law from which we find, in which we find the rules applicable to sanctions? And second, if that's the case, if the Security Council is bound by general international law, what are the rules specifically applicable to sanctions, and why apply the countermeasure rules rather than the rules that have been suggested by some others, human rights rules or international humanitarian law. The Security Council has arguably both the authority and perhaps even the duty to apply economic sanctions in some context. Where it finds under Article 39 a breach of the peace, a threat to the peace, or an act of aggression, it may take measures to restore international peace and security, and those measures may include up to armed force. But before authorizing armed force, the Security Council should consider the lesser measures of Article 41 to be inadequate before it authorizes a use of armed force. So in that context, it may have a duty in some cases to actually apply um, sanctions. Let me read from Article 41, and that serves also to be the definition of the sanctions that I'm talking about today. The Security Council may decide what measures not involving the use of armed force are to be employed to give effect to its decisions, and it may call upon members of the United Nations to apply such measures. These may include complete or partial interruption of economic relations, and of braille, sea, air, postal, telegraphic, radio, and other means of communications, and the severance of diplomatic relations. Does the Security Council have to observe any international law rules in how it applies Article 41? 
41 itself does not say anything about how those provisions are applied. And in fact, there's a, a, a rather old notion that is still apparently held by a few people that the Security Council is an institution above the law and that when it's acting under Chapter 7, it has no limiting principles on its conduct. My view has always been that that particular view flies in the face of other charter principles, in particular Article 24, Paragraph 2, which says that in discharging these duties, the Security Council shall act in accordance with the purposes and principles of the United Nations. And among those, in the very first, purpose of the United Nations is to maintain international peace and security. Article 1, paragraph 1 says that the purposes of the United Nations are to maintain international peace and security and to that end to take effective collective measures for the prevention and removal of threats to the peace and for the suppression of acts of aggression and other breaches of the peace and to bring about by peaceful means and in conformity with the principles of justice and international law, adjustment or settlement of international disputes or situations which might lead to a breach of the peace. Now, I'm not, some of you, of course, have Article 1 memorized, so I don't have to emphasize this for you. Probably my reading it may not have been picked up by everyone, but Article 1 does not precisely apply the rules of general international law to the acts of the Security Council in taking measures with regard to uh, peace and security. It seems to apply more precisely to actions short of uh, use of our conflict or responding to <coughs> peace and security. Nevertheless, many of us would see that call for general international law to, in fact, be a condition on how the Security Council conducts all of its actions, all of them under Chapter 7 included. Judge Weirmontri, in his dissenting opinion in the Lockerbie case, made the statement that the history of the United Nations Charter corroborates the view that a clear limitation on the plenitude of the Security Council's powers is that those powers must be exercised in accordance with well-established principles of international law. Now, this view is also plainly shared by those who take the position that the Security Council must follow principles of the, of the law of war and international humanitarian law in those uses of force that the Council authorizes. Professor Schindler has written that it is from the obligation on the Council to obey general international law that the Council must um, uh, follow international humanitarian law and the laws of war in armed conflicts off, or the use of armed force authorized by the Security Council. So, but in order to get to this position, you have to see the Security Council as being uh, bound by general international law since there is no particular principle in the Charter with regard to humanitarian law. The Charter mentions human rights, but not the laws of war and international humanitarian law in particular. So you'd have to go to this general obligation to obey the rules um, for the United Nations. And I want to also mention that those who take that view are not uh, deterred by the fact that the rules on the law of war and um, international humanitarian law were not developed for international organizations with them in mind, was they were developed for states, and nevertheless, the view is that the Security Council is bound by those rules. Well, if the Council is bound by those rules, from those well-established rules of international law, I think we can conclude that the rules with regard to sanctions also apply to the Security Council, even though these rules also were mostly developed in the authoritative statements about them are generally with regard to unilateral sanctions. But what are these rules that have been developed and how might they work to mitigate the United Nations sanctions regimes and why do I think there's some preference to look to these rules over some others? The rules found, the rules with regard to countermeasures of course began developing in the law of armed reprisals, the most authoritative statement about them being in the Nalila arbitration, and then further developed for peaceful uses in the air services arbitration between the United States and France. It's really from that arbitration that the International Law Commission has heavily relied to develop further what it has 
uh, calling the law of countermeasures. The International Court of Justice in 1997 in Gatchikovo, Nag Morris, relied on the International Law Commission's work drafting and development with regard to countermeasures to um, uh, apply uh, the rules in that case against um, uh, Slovakia, Czechoslovakia. And we've got some further development of the rules of countermeasures, interestingly and importantly, I think, from the World Trade Organization and their focus on proportionality in taking retaliatory or countermeasures. And from all these sources, we find the definition of countermeasures to be um, otherwise wrongful actions taken in response to a prior wrong. And from all these sources, we find that there are at least four important conditioning limitations on the use of measures of that kind. First, they must always be proportional to the wrong. Second, they must be necessary for the purpose of terminating the wrong. They cannot have the purpose of punishing the wrongdoer or of continuing after termination of the wrong, or they cannot be used if we know from the outset they're going to have absolutely no impact on um, incurring uh, in, uh, in bringing about the cessation of the wrong. They must be aimed at the wrongdoer, a very important principle of the law of countermeasures. And finally, there is a carved out group of measures that can never be taken, prohibited countermeasures that would violate fundamental principles of human rights, diplomatic protections, or I would argue also protections of the environment. How might these principles apply to the United Nations Security Council regime with regard to Iraq and possibly mitigated the effect the sanctions have had um, on that country, effects that we know quite well have been extremely severe? First, proportional to the wrong. Is the United Nations sanctions regime proportional to the wrong? The wrong, as I understand it today, that the United Nations sanctions regime is aimed against is to prevent the development of weapons of mass destruction by the Saddam Hussein regime. According to my colleague at Ohio State, John Mueller, in a recent article called Sanctions of Mass Destruction, the sanctions themselves have resulted in he says uh, hundreds of thousands have contributed to hundreds of thousands of deaths. We do not have the sense that weapons that Saddam Hussein has developed or has used in the past, chemical weapons, etc., have had that uh, sort of impact. There is no question that deterring a wrong such as development of mass destruction would, can include very severe sanctions but I suggest to you that the impact of the sanctions we are using have been out of proportion to the wrong that we're aiming at. <laughs> we also should consider the time period when weighing proportionality, and perhaps the sanctions regime at the time when it first began was proportional, but after 10 years, the amount of, of pain that we have inflicted through the sanctions regime, it needs reconsideration whether it continues to be proportional. That, I think, is a, uh, implicit in all sanctions regime or all countermeasures regime that they be constantly assessed so that proportionality remains part of the regime. <coughs> Necessity to end the wrong. After 10 years, again, I think we have to reconsider whether a complete economic embargo on the country of Iraq is necessary to end the regime. It has not, in fact, had that impact. Saddam Hussein has withstood it. My colleague John Mueller has argued instead that what would have been effective in this case were far more targeted, limited sanctions aimed exactly at the wrong in a more precise way, stop the inputs of uh, two weapons of mass destruction from being imported into Iraq. That will be the kind of necessary countermeasure or sanction which can result in an end to the violation that we have in mind here. And thirdly, targeting. This is an interesting aspect of countermeasures, I think, to, uh, to, to consider. Certainly when this idea or when this principle standard was developed that the, the countermeasures have to aim at the wrongdoer, we very much had in mind aiming at a state. That's certainly the case in Malila and Air Services, that uh, it was not considered that 
individual responsible for a policy would be the target. But with the development of individual responsibility evolving in international law very rapidly, in fact, in the last um, years, I think we should reconsider what that idea in the common measures rules means, that you must aim at the wrongdoer. It's not just to leave third, innocent third states out, that too, but perhaps it also means that the sanctions should be more carefully aimed at individuals responsible for the wrongdoing. In this case, Saddam Hussein and his um, administration, and certainly to go beyond um, in the, in the sanctions, to go beyond limiting inputs to putting travel bans on Saddam Hussein, freezing his assets and the assets of his friends abroad, putting particular course of pressure upon those individuals, uh, to me seems more consistent with what the countermeasures regime requires. But why countermeasures and not other principles? Some of you will already hear that a number of these principles are in, quite similar, if not the same, as what we might find in international humanitarian law or human rights principles. And to the extent that those are applicable and have an impact, I, I, I don't need to exclude them. But I'm not certain in all cases that they are going to be as helpful to actually get legality, which we see when uh, applying sanctions. Professor Reisman, um, when he talked about the Haiti regime, argued very eloquently to consider applying international humanitarian law by analogy to economic sanctions. Of course, um, international humanitarian law was developed in the armed conflict context and was carefully not considered to apply to non-lethal means such as uh, 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 economics. But Professor Reisman makes a point that my colleague John Mueller does and that fact economic sanctions can be as lethal or more lethal in their actual effect um, in terms of, 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 of deaths and should perhaps be considered to fall under international humanitarian law, at least, at least by analogy. I have some concerns with that because of the development of those rules outside the context of armed conflict. Let me give you just uh, an example of one concern. In the law of armed conflict, one of the most important principles of course is uh, non-combatant immunity, this rule of distinction that of course it is appropriate um, and lawful to target combatants and non-combatants must not be the target of um, lethal force during um, armed conflict. And that's in fact the rule that as a reason looks to and says we shouldn't be targeting persons who haven't contributed to the sanctions or to the wrongdoing in applying the sanctions regime. But in the law of armed conflict, if a leader abuses the non-combatant immunity, the non-combatant immunity is lost. And that's for a very important reason uh, related to the context of, of the rules on um, humanitarian law. <coughs> if uh, if non-combatants of civilians are ordered to or end up having, for example, a gun emplacement put in their house, then of course it's legitimate for their opponents to target that gun emplacement and it's for the protection of the opponent's own personnel. They should not be allowed to be sitting ducks when the uh, non-combatant immunity has been abused by the leader of the other side. That, that's simply not the context for um, sanctions or countermeasures. If a, a um, leader such as Saddam Hussein is abusing the humanitarian exceptions which have been built into the sanctions, there's no danger to us on the other side in our nation's international community which is imposing these sanctions. Um, we're not going to be threatened and there is, so we don't have the same reason to ignore the um, uh, abuse and remove the waiver, the humanitarian waiver in that case. So in other words, if Saddam Hussein is selling the food that he is allowed to purchase for his people to Lebanon or Jordan, we need to still consider the necessity and proportionality of those sanctions in the circumstances. And so the abuse which may make his people a target, if we're looking at international humanitarian law, they no longer get the benefit of the immunity, is simply not the case in the sanctions regime. It could continue to we still need to apply proportionality in that context. And human rights, rather, a similar problem. If we're trying to say that the sanctions violate human rights, we often hear the um, 
defense made by the United States, for example, which is a supporter of the United Nations um, sanctions against Iraq, that it's not us who are violating human rights. It's Saddam Hussein because he won't buy the food, he sells it to um, uh, Jordan and Lebanon, or he won't um, uh, comply with the obligation not to produce weapons of mass destruction. And so it's really his action. The causation problem gets there. Or, in, in, as, as by way of another example, of applying the human rights um, principles, if a, a number of writers have recently said that the United Nations is committing genocide through its, the Iraqi sanctions regime. But as you know, to um, find a violation of genocide, you have to find intent. And I, I, I sorry, I just see no intent by those who oppose the sanctions to commit a genocide in Iraq. Whereas, once again, the sanctions rules have to be proportional, necessary, and appropriately targeted in the circumstances. Those rules go to the sanctions and apply to the sanctions maker, the sanctions composer, and we don't have to look for <coughs> causation problems if it's really us um, and not Saddam Hussein who are the cause of the problems. So I think for those reasons, we really need to think about applications of the countermeasures regime, the rules on the applications of sanctions to um, all of the sanctions imposed by multilateral groupings. I think in that way, we'll end up having lawful sanctions, and I very much hope they will also be humane sanctions. Thank you very much. left. So to the extent someone might have a pressing question, I would ask that you speak loudly because you can tell we're recording this session. And also, if you will identify yourself and identify to whom you're asking the question, we'll field perhaps two questions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Enid Adler from Philadelphia, and my question is to uh, Susan. Uh, are you aware, and I think maybe a lot of people aren't, just how big uh, business it is for people who are coming here illegally to be kept in prison, it's big business for the prisons, that they actually get paid more for illegal aliens to be in prison than the new normal prisoners. And you may know a little more about that one. Well, I, I have no doubt that uh, there is a profit motive involved. Uh, and I don't have statistics on the profitability of holding uh, illegal aliens in prison, but it makes a lot of sense to me that uh, there's an economic motive behind it. Hopefully, this uh, violent of uh, uh, victims uh, of trafficking uh, act will help this situation because government officials, including INS officials, are going to have to receive training in the identification of a specific class of illegal alien, which is a sex traffic victim. And those people are not to be put in prisons or detention centers. They are to be given protective shelter. But, um, now this is from my experience with the Chinese boat people and all yeah. the other If you have any statistics on that, I would like, like very much to receive uh, any information you have because it supports my argument that, uh, that we're dealing with a cost-benefit analysis, and we've just got to make the money uh, uh, not worth it to these people to engage into, in this industry. Okay, we'll accept one more question, although I would encourage you to ask any of the panelists on an informal basis for more information, because I think they've done a very nice job in presenting a diverse topic, or at least a diverse approach to a topic that does have some unifying themes. Last question. Sean Murphy from George Washington University. My question is for Professor O'Connell. Um, in light of time, I won't uh, quibble with you about whether or not it's really the UN sanctions that are causing starvation in Iraq. Um, but I would like to ask you to address a somewhat broader conceptual concern I have with the whole idea of applying countermeasures law to UN uh, Security Council sanctions. And that is, obviously, that law arose in the context of bilateral disputes, although uh, air services and whatnot. And you can see how you would design a law there to try to create something of a level playing field so that one side won't go too far in reacting to another. But when we're talking about the Security Council, aren't we in a very different environment 
where it was set up not as sort of a party to a bilateral dispute, obviously, but instead an organ that was supposed to have global responsibilities for doing things like determining what wrong exists and how serious that wrong is. Because it seems to me if we try to apply these criteria you have for countermeasures, those criteria turn on an assessment of the wrong. And it seems like you're saying we're going to take something other than the Security Council to determine that so that we can know if the Security Council is going too far or not. But isn't the whole point in leaving it to the Security Council to make those kinds of assessments? Well, in your first comment, I, I think just underscores my argument in favor of applying these rules to sanctions. It, what is causing the starvation? In my um, paradigm, we don't have to ask that question. Every sanctions regime that the Security Council supports should meet certain standards. And so it doesn't matter really what the effects are as long as the, um, uh, the standards are being met or we don't have to trace causation. Of course, it goes to then uh, measuring proportionality. But if you're suggesting that Saddam Hussein is really the cause of starvation, to me, that question doesn't have to be addressed um, whether he's causing it or not whether they're proportional in the circumstances to the wrong. But uh, I can tell from Professor Murphy's face that we'll have to talk about this more later. Um, but, but then to, to the more fundamental question, which is these rules, as, as I suggested, have been developed for bilateral relations. Why apply them to the special circumstances of the Security Council, which is supposed to have more power and be in a more privileged position for accomplishing all these important principles than normal states? I think I would um, suggest that I don't think the principles and countermeasures developed to keep the situation um, equal between states. It is a, in taking a countermeasure that's a means to coerce law compliance by another state, so it does upset the, uh, the balance between states, and it should give one uh, party more power than another party in order to bring this coercion. But in allowing that, an exception to the rules and a permission to violate the normal rights of states to trade, to allow travel, and so forth, we want, uh, we have a sense in international law that there are standards that these lawful coercive measures need to meet in order to retain that imprimatur of being lawful, just like any sanctions or any enforcement means. I think the better analogy is to police conduct. Although we give police more power in order to um, coerce people into obeying the law, it's not unlimited power. It should um, conform to a notion of justice and limits so that we don't end up creating a monster in trying to accomplish other goals. And I think that is inherently how we, as an international community, view the Security Council as well. Yes, we've given the Security Council more authority, more power, the right to authorize the use of armed force that states do not have. But in, allow, in, in doing that, we've also asked the Security Council to obey minimal principles of international humanitarian law. And I think we've asked them to obey minimal standards of lawful countermeasures. What is lawful? I think it's not too much to ask the Security Council to only use those sanctions that are proportional, necessary, and properly targeted. Um, and anyone who continue, or wishes to continue their dialogue, there is going to be another panel in this room, so we're going to have to go to leave. I thank each of you for your uh, presence here, and if you would welcome, I mean, again, thank you. Thank you.